Hello everyone and welcome to another webinar. This is our Talent and Development Web 2018 episode and edition. And today we're going to be talking about the use of learning methods and media to design training. So if you're an instructional designer or you want to be an instructional designer, this is the webinar for you. So we're lucky we have a guest, so our guest speaker and now someone that's going to co-host with me. Our uh, guest speaker is known to a lot of you. Her name is Eno. So Eno Iniwori Kabo. And I think I pronounced that right. Eno is a managing consultant of Skills Dynamic Services Limited. She's a customer service consultant. She's also a trainer. And she's also representing Nigeria in ATD. So she's the our representative, our rep for Nigeria for uh, the Association for Talent Development. So anyone thinking of um, um, going for this, um, going for the next ATD conference, which is going to happen, I think, in Washington next year, you could um, you could just contact Eno and you'll be able to get a big discount. So Eno will be able to give you money. Okay, my name is Eno Iniwori Kabo. I'm the Managing Consultant Skills Dynamic Services Limited. I'm a customer service consultant certified by Service Quality Institute USA. I'm also, I was also a senior manager with FITC, where I headed the business units. I'm also an accredited um, management trainer by Center for Management Development. I also an association member of ATD, as well as learning and development, as well as the AT delegation leader from Nigeria, formerly an and yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, so you are a banker as well. So you like finance, like me. Mm, oh yes, I do. <laughs> All right, All right. Thanks right. a lot for joining us, Eno. Thank and you. so today's topic, we're talking about training media and methods. So we'll we'll be going through together and seeing how 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 that goes, and probably get some questions from the. Our, our audience, really, our virtual audience. So here's the agenda, guys. So what does it all mean? What does media, what does method mean? Many people mix it up, methods and media. What exactly is that? Types of learning methods, we talk about that. Types of learning media. Criteria for choosing methods. We talk about how to combine methods and media and what does it mean when you combine them. And then we talk about some scenarios for instructional design on using those methods and uh, media. So that's it. And then, of course, uh, we'll talk about experiences, especially Eno's experiences in developing training and delivering training, because that's a, another core part of this webinar to try and pick Eno's brain for free. And for those that want to learn and become top notch like her, at least you have her for one hour. That's excellent. So All thanks, right. Eno, for joining us. Thank you, David, for having me. All right. So let's. Let's move on. So what are training methods and what are training media? So training is a combination of methods and media. That's what training really is. So from a design perspective, that's what it is. There are different, uh, infinite combinations of methods and media you can mix and match. So, but if you want to understand the big difference, methods are the active ingredients of a training program. And the media is basically how or the way the training itself is delivered. Yeah. So the way the training or even the learning process is delivered is the media. But the active ingredients of ac the actual training itself is the methods. So you could use a particular method for different media. But we'll be seeing more examples as we go along. Or oh, Eno, do you have anything to add to this small definition? Yeah, um, what I would like to add here is that um, looking at method, methods are, they are the instructional techniques that facilitate the learning. And they are also, like you've mentioned, the active ingredients. Without them, learning can really take place. And then looking at the media, mm -hmm. the media are the means of implementing those methods which you have chosen during the course of the uh, designing of your of the program and that really yes. gives, the, gives is the vehicle by which the instruction is formatted and stored and delivered to the learner so that gives it you they both have to work hand in hand in order to make the learning impactful 
Yes, yes. Okay, super. Thanks a lot. That's exactly it. So again, um, we'll go we'll go through in detail. So what I'll give you now is four popular methods used in training. So we'll talk about the four popular active ingredients used to deliver training. So our first method is usually everybody likes it, and that's what exactly I'm doing now is watching a video. Watching a video is a method. So watching a video is so one of the methods. So what I'll do is I'll give you all four, and then we'll talk about media, and then we'll see how do we mix and match all these things. So this is a method of delivering a training, right? Active ingredients, right? It's video. Another active ingredient is just a facilitator lecturette. So a facilitator, a facilitator lecturing is another uh, method, right? So it's another method of delivery, right? And then we have workbook exercises. That's another method. So we did that a lot in school, obviously. It gave us um, a workbook, and all we did is use that workbook to, to learn, right? It's another method. And the last method I have is peer discussion. So you're actually learning through peer discussion. So those are four core methods. So um, I, I don't know, I know, do you have any, any, any more, any mix and match of these methods? Which do yeah. you use regularly? I, I, I use all four, and also I also use role play. You can also add role play. Okay. As, um, case okay. Studies. You also ha add um, mm -hmm. kind of some demonstrations um, showing the step-by-step -step performance of how the process, especially if you're looking at a, a process-oriented training, you demonstrate it, mm -hmm. let people see how clearly the step-by-step -step the process would take to achieve the results. So I think those are the ones mm -hmm. I have from the four you have just um, listed. Yeah, so <clears throat> the in combination of all of this, yeah. uh, and you use all. So that's what you, you are really a master trainer. So you know how when to use what. So that's really when you know. Okay, you've done an excellent instructional design. Is when exactly. should I use this method? When should I use that method? It's very very mm -hmm. key. All right, super. So let's go over to media. So learning the media. As we said already, media is a platform or delivery mechanism. So how will we deliver? How, what's the mechanism we're going to use to deliver this, this training, to really deliver these methods that we just mentioned, right? So um, like video, for example, what's the mechanism of delivering video? I could be in a classroom and I would deliver video in the classroom, or I could do an online, just do it as an online assignment or something like that. So media is how the learning, learner receives the training. That's what media is, how the learner receives the training. It's, it's the way the learner, the learning itself is delivered. That's what media is. So media is the package used to deliver learning methods. That's the media. Now, there's always a debate, which media is best, which media is best. There's so much new media coming out now that let me just quickly go through four ways learning is delivered via media. Okay, so I'll go through the major four ways. And the first one is, everybody knows it, classroom. So classroom is the first one, yes, and it's very popular, it's good. And again, classroom itself, remember this is media. The media itself is classroom. In the classroom, you use different methods. So classroom is one. Another one, webinar. So right now I'm using a webinar and this is the media I'm using to deliver this um, learning to everybody here. And that's what me and Eno are using. We're using webinar as our media. Uh, another thing close to webinar is a virtual training. Now, now a virtual training is a, bit, is a bit different from a webinar because in the webinar right now, uh, most of you guys are watching the webinar. You're not interacting directly with me but uh, it's live, just like a virtual training. But in a virtual training, there's so many methods you could use in the virtual training. I could do a peer discussion in the virtual training. I will just set two people up and they will go off to a, a virtual room, a virtual meeting room, and you two will discuss. So I can peer people up and do peer, peer discussion, role play. I could do role play in my virtual training. So there's some really excellent virtual training software out there that are really try and mimic the classroom because the cl classroom is classic, isn't it? Classic classroom. So there's classroom, which a lot of people like. So everything you see in this classroom, you could do it virtually. The only thing is you can't 
touch and feel people. Not yet, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so then, <laughs> but the, but the webinar is another means of learning uh, training. It's a media, but it's not as interactive as the virtual training. So that's number two. Number three, we have listening to a podcast. So just just listening. So just listening to a podcast. Uh, a lot of you, if you have an iPhone. I will advise you download the podcast. There's a podcast app. And, and when you download the podcast app, you have podcasts from many different sources. For example, you could have a podcast from The Economist, a podcast from McKinsey, podcast from different people put in podcasts, which is just recorded audio. And you can play those recorded audio at any time. It's really helpful. Very, very helpful. And also, this is a media for learning. So the last media I'll talk about is self-paced e-learning. So that's the last media, self-paced e-learning. And uh, this is when you go to uh, Coursera, for example, Coursera, or you go to LinkedIn Learning. Or in fact, we have our own platform, officetraininghub.com. So www.officetraininghub.com. Those are recorded learning or recorded videos or text or whatever methods that you want to use you put that recorded you record those and put it online for people to use at any time they like so it's it's e-learning so those are the four main media and how we learning um Eno, do you have any anything to add on this I think basically that's all we we have the major medias because all the methods yes. are also used in each of them as it were. So that's yes. basically what we have really. Mm -hmm. that's basically mm -hmm. And then there, yes, yes, and then there are some methods that kind of lend themselves better to a media. So, so, yes, so if you know what I mean. So that's where you now start talking about methods and media so if i want to do a peer discussion or, or a role play the best media for a role play is obviously classroom or physical you need to physically be there for a role play discussion so if your training intervention requires role play then obviously there's a classroom element so you now decide as an instructional designer the method i need to use is role play and then, so the media will be classroom, right? Yes. Or the media could even be coaching. You, you probably go in and physically coaching and stuff. So another one is, okay, I need to, before the role play, I need people to understand certain, the certain knowledge that I need to transfer. Obviously, you now ask yourself, that knowledge, what should I use? What media should I use for that knowledge? You could decide to record a, a podcast, send it to them. That's a podcast. The media is podcast. You could decide, you know what, I'll record a course and put it as self-paced e-learning. So that's where you start mixing methods and media. But let's move on. Let's go on. So selecting the learning methods. So that's what I've just said now, selecting learning methods. What is the criteria for us to select the learning method that will best suit what we are trying to teach. So let's look at that. Really, there are three. There are three major criteria to use when selecting learning methods. Three major criteria. So we'll be going through them. Well, I'll just list them out for you. It's learning objectives, learner preferences, and practical limitations. Those are the three major criteria that you need to use when you decide, when you're trying to select the learning methods to use. Or, or I know, have you seen any any other way? What other methods do you think? When, when you're trying to select learning methods, what do you do? Um, what, what process do you follow? Uh, for me, for process, just like you mentioned, the learning objectives, what are the, what are the learners going to, what would be the expectation? What is the goal you're expecting? that they will need to meet or learn at the end of the, of the program. You know, that will mm -hmm. also guide you because if, for example, you said, oh, at the end of the program, I will want them to be able to use the telephone effectively. In essence, you know that you need to look at the process. And then when you're looking at process, you need to look at some role play methods to choose. Uh, that's role play, answering the phone, also, you can also do, use the, the learning method of uh, demonstrating it actually for them to see or have a video mm -hmm. clip showing that process. 
you know these are things that yes. you know, the learning objective and then you also look at the um the um the um, learning preference of the learner uh yes. what, what you would call what they are the style you know from the way you mm -hmm. look at the audience you tell whether some would want to look look at more visual they want to learn they learn better visually and some you could also look at okay maybe you tell a story about yourself concerning the particular a topic which you are looking at and you know you can tell and you see people's are littered up based on the method which you are using and you kind of emphasize that all throughout the program that means you have actually chosen mm -hmm. looking at i've seen the criteria seen the kind of method they want they prefer in 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 the delivery of the uh, the training group 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 uh, peer discussion mm -hmm. is another awesome aspect that you can key mm -hmm. in there looking at because you okay. see people get Super. excited when they are together you know and that's mm -hmm. another way of looking at what methods you can All right. use yes so that's the criteria to use in selecting learning methods. Excellent. So we'll look at these three step criteria, which we said is learning objectives, learner preferences, and practical limitations. Let me go through them one at a time. So for learning objectives, now, obviously, the first thing you should kind of know about is something called Bloom's Blooms. If you don't know Bloom's and you, you, you really need to go find, find out Bloom's Taxonomy. So Bloom's as in B-L-O-O-M-S, Bloom's Taxonomy, he broke down um, learning really into domains and levels. So depending on the domain and the level you are trying to, you know, work on, uh, that will kind of guide um, the the what kind of methods to use because you need to know the domain and the level for you to be able to um, uh, create your effective uh, objectives really create effective learning objectives so learning objectives you break them break them down really into three what what are the um what is it a knowledge gap is that what you're trying to cover? Is that a knowledge gap? So that's your learn one of the key things in learning objectives. Is there a knowledge gap? Is it a skill gap? Because you need to identify whether it's a knowledge gap, whether it's a, a skill gap, and then also whether it's an um, attitude gap or something. some people say behavioral, behavioral gap. So those are the two, the three domains, okay? When you identify the domain, that will kind of give you an idea of what kind of methods to use. So we you, is it a skill gap? If it's a skill gap, okay, obviously they they need to really be more practical and do stuff with their fingers and go and actually practice if it's a skill gap. Is it a knowledge gap? Knowledge gap, you can ask them to read something or you could just put a very short video on something that will cover the knowledge gap. But then attitude gap or um, how would I call it, a behavioral gap. The methods would be something like Eno said, um, um, peer, um, uh, uh, yeah. well, uh, when you have a behavioral gap, peer discussion, you need to, it's something that really needs that physical presence more. Yeah. It would be difficult to use uh, other, other kinds of uh, methods, really. So that's, that's learning, learning objectives. And you should check out Bloom's three domains, which is what I just mentioned, Bloom's learning objectives. Yeah, and then there are levels of learning as well. You know, there are levels of learning apart from just the learning objectives. We have, I think, five, if I'm not mistaken, five or six levels. There's definitely a knowledge level. There is the, um, well, there's the knowledge, skill, and attitude. But then you have whether it's application, I'm trying to remember those um, um, uh Bloom's levels. There are six six levels for Bloom, uh, apart from the domains, which is basically the skills, the attitude, and the knowledge. The levels themselves is how deep you are going. Is it an application? Is it just knowledge? Because that's a level level as well. Is it just knowledge? Is it application? Is it a more um, understanding it in a deeper sense, so to say? But I don't know. Do, do you do you use this methodology? Um, you know. Yeah, um, if it has to do with knowledge, um, let's say there is a knowledge gap, you know that there will be more of an intensive kind of uh, lecture going on for them to be able to have knowledge about the skill they want to learn. 
And like you said, if for skills, you need to demonstrate whatever it is. But for attitude, attitude, you know, you need to deep, you know, need to deep, um, go deep into into the, the the themselves. You know, kind of help them, make them have mm -hmm. a self assessment of who they are. Because if people don't understand who they are, it can't change behavior, nor it can change attitude. So we need they need to have okay. common, kind of some ass assessments have to come into play in order to change attitude. Mm -hmm. Let them have a self awareness mm -hmm. of who they are. Where where are their weaknesses? Where yeah. are their strengths? You know, and then you yes. see, with that because if you would, have knowledge. Mm. If you have knowledge and skill without the behavioral side, well, you have the knowledge and skill. You just keep it. You won't use it to change <laughs> to change your behavior. So, uh, which is why the, the Bloom's levels uh, mostly there's knowledge level. Uh, is the level you want to go comprehension is then is a bit higher than the knowledge. Then application, then analysis, and then they have synthesis and evaluation. So those are the levels that of uh, Bloom's levels. How far you're going to go with those levels? So mixing a mixture of domain and levels is what you use to create your learning objectives. So general rule to apply when selecting learning methods uh, tied to learning objectives. So so I guess depending on which domain and level of learning you are trying to uh, apply, certain learning methods work better. Just like Eno said. So your general rule is knowledge objectives can be learned by knowledge methods. For example, if you have a, just a knowledge objective um, to be able to understand color codes or something, I don't know. That's just a knowledge objectives. So reading a document or watching a video is fine. Do you get that? that that's reading a document or watching a video will work. If it's a skill objective, then obviously you need to learn by actually doing that skill. So... Um, you, you can't learn by just reading. You need to do it. So there needs to be some action. So, for example, what we do, we do analyst training. And analyst training has a skill objective. It's purely a skill objective. So what happens is in the classroom, once they come, they have case studies. So they have case studies that try and mimic what issues they would see in real life. And then what they're doing there is practicing. And a lot of times, most of what they do, they need a computer to do it and they need a software, mostly Excel. So they're actually practicing and practicing and practicing right there in the classroom to mimic that situation. So it's, it's a bit like role play, but we're role playing between you and the problem, <laughs> not, not you and someone else. So, so that's a skill objective. But an attitude objective these are often learned best when you're actually together as a group. So it is rare to be able to change someone's attitude by lecturing to them. You can't just stand and lecture, lecture, lecture. The attitude won't change. That needs a little bit more thinking through, right? And you have to be in a group. Now, it could be in a group online. That's the media. Or it could be in a group in a classroom. It depends. You can choose the media most appropriate, but I think classroom is pretty appropriate for that as well and then you can also do a, a role play with them interviews and stuff on a webinar using the media for webinar every week you check up on them for one hour or 10 minutes every week online that could work as well so i know Eno, you do a lot of these uh, role play related things how do you manage it changing people's attitude uh changing people's attitude you can tell a lot of stories about other people's lives and see how, because sometimes you see that in life, people have been there before. And uh, it's like uh, when Obama was speaking at the conference um, la, uh, in May, he talked about smoking. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that he said, the only reason why he changed his, his, his that habit was because he didn't want to, you know, his children to copy him because they are seeing him as a role model could you could you say could, could you say that again the line cut a little bit could you could you repeat okay. that so obama when, was smoking and he stopped smoking he stopped smoking his wife had pestered him but he said no his wife did not help change him it was him himself coming to that realization as a father as a role model to his daughters are you saying that mm. the realization yeah. for attitude change has to come from within yourself. I may tell you stories about it and about how I have made my change. That also makes you begin to think about your own 
and then you can now begin to apply that change because it takes time it's not it's not overnight mm. it has to take you practicing consciously moving in that direction now a, a classroom a classroom um, training will just kind of activate it but it is the individual that brings about the enforcement of that change in attitude and uh, mm -hmm. again in the workplace what will also happen is that if that is the case in the workplace um you know reinforcement of that change in attitude has to come from the managers or supervisors so the learning also goes beyond the classroom yeah, so, so that mm -hmm. you know, so, keeps going on and on yeah Definitely. So whatever training, if you're an instructional designer, yes, you can design, but you must ensure that there's a buy-in of the supervisor. So whatever it is you've taught these people in classroom, media, wherever, once they get back, the supervisors must be encouraged to encourage them to yes. practice that skill or try and help them change that behavior. Do you get it? If you don't get the buy-in of your the supervisors, forget it. Nothing will happen. Yeah. Nothing will happen. Right, super. So that's that's we've of course covered learning objectives. Now let's talk about the second bit of it, which is learner preferences. So learner preferences are another key part we should look at. Under learner preferences, so we're saying obviously, yes, we have this objective, we've done Bloom's taxonomy, we know the domains we're trying to hit, we know the 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 levels we're trying to hit, and then we know the methods that we need to use, but then you need to think about learner preferences everybody has different preferences do you know yours do you know which one do you which one do you like which which kind of media do you really like do you get which methods do you like yeah so the learner's background will help for example that's one aspect so i'll go through learner preferences let's look at three main things the learner's background so what do we need to know about the learner's background uh, to be able to know, okay, what this preference, let's change our design a little bit to accommodate this person's uh, preferences. Yeah. So uh, background, uh, you know, any, anything to say about background? Has background come to play in some of the courses you've designed? Yeah, background in kind of like what I try to do in terms of learner's uh, background, um, you know, at the beginning of the program, like sometimes like an, an icebreaker, I use an icebreaker. There's a simple one I normally use. I say, use the letters of your name to define yourself. You know, from the mm. statement they make in, in words that define them, you could tell from what background. For example, someone who is uh, an auditor will say he is a very analytical person. You know, from there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then some may say, oh, I'm a nice person. Some may say, I, I'm a. I don't I um I don't take nonsense. You know, kind of you kind of now know where to fit them in. And then with that back background, you could also tell that they are either visual kind of people or they are people mm -hmm. who are more physical, they want actions, they want to see demonstrations. Mm -hmm. like yes. You know, mm -hmm. so these are things you need to check out. And then you during the course of the program, you bring those um, areas to play in the in the in your design your design may change a little bit if you are seeing that more people are into more visual you can quickly look at maybe during break quickly get more of uh, youtube videos to show or you could see that they are more physical and uh, they want the more of activities and then you could quickly come up with an activity driven a situation that will also keep them uh, focused and reinforcing the learning as they go on Nice, nice. All right, so that's learner background. Also, the, the learn, learner's experiences. So you, you're doing a training and you have some real people with lots of experience in the audience and some that have little experience in the audience. You need to mix and match. Sometimes it's good to have learners with similar experiences in one training so that it's not as difficult, especially a skill-based training. If you have someone that's very experienced already, maybe he'll get a little bit bored. He already has that skill set. and Or he's not really, he's trying to share, he can't really share or get new experiences from others because he's seen quite a lot already. So learner, learner experiences are pretty important as well. And I'll jump to the last one first before we get okay, Anna's comments on that in, one. Sorry, can I just jump in into okay. the learning experience? Okay, let's uh, should jump in at yeah. learner's experience. Learner's yes. experience. I mean, there was a class where I was talking about um, 
ethics and professionalism. No, it was um, etiquette. Um, that's the um, on on uh, etiquette actually etiquette on um, business etiquette generally. And I had okay. these ma uh, senior managers in the class, and I also had some um, low level staff. And uh, basically, a time came where I kind of let go, let the senior managers themselves take over the class. It was an awesome class hmm. because at the end we had an we had a total experience of almost about uh, fifty years. So you can wow. imagine the benefit which mm -hmm. the uh, mm -hmm. younger um, attendees had. You know, sharing their experiences. So don't some don't let because if you if you just do if you you as a facilitator want to just dominate the experience sharing, the ex yes. senior those who had the, ex the the senior managers who are there kind of okay, mm -hmm. what am I here for? Okay, let exactly. me let this get through. You know, I'm just waiting yeah, for this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, so definitely I, take advantage yes, take advantage yes, of that diversity. That, yes, yes. And that helps. Yes. That mm -hmm. helps a great deal, yes. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Nice. So, and, and learner experiences could be as simple as even language as, as well. Maybe English is their second language, for example. And so you need to take that into consideration when planning your media and planning your methods because um, that experience, not very good with the language. Uh, just like an example I saw somewhere, there was this German engineer who was sent to America, very 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 experienced engineer he was given a promotion sent to the head office in america and he hated it why did he hate it he will sit inside meetings he can't contribute as much because his english is very bad and everybody else will be looking and saying oh who is this guy what does he know but this guy he knows more than nearly everybody there but he couldn't express it because he didn't have the language so it's um interesting when you look at that you need to look at all sides so yes learner experiences is another key aspect in deciding what method or media to use right so another one uh, another learner experience uh, learner preference is the learner's distinct qualities what distinct qualities does the learner come with and again one one distinct quality again as i said someone with so much so particular kind of experience that uh, only needs a particular intervention. So, and then someone else that has, like you just mentioned, where the managers had so much experience that they, that experience, you use that experience in your training, you know, which was really, yeah. really smart. And everybody got something out of it, which is, and maybe when they get back to their office, uh, they will see distinct qualities in their managers that they didn't even know before because now their managers really talked and and shared experiences with the the whole team so it's it's an opportunity to learn quite a lot so here we've talked about learning objectives we've talked about learner preferences the third thing that will help us in planning or choosing our learning methods and media uh, or here, here I'm just giving a summary, choosing learning methods based on learning objectives and learner preferences. Okay, we've, we've already given good summaries of that. But the learner preferences, let me play a video. One key thing is, do we know our style? Do we all know, do you know what style you, you like or what style you, you, you are, your own learning style? I don't know. Enno, do you have an idea what's the best way you learn? Oh, I learn more of visual as well as reading and writing. Oh, visual. So you're yeah, more yeah, visual. Very, very visual. Okay. And then I love reading and writing. I mean, as you're talking, I'm taking down notes. That's the best uh, way I learn. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to play everyone a short video, just about three and a half minutes. And I want you to identify what's your learning style. So let's see. Let's watch this short video. Josh Hudson here with Pinnacle Man. In this video, I'm going to go over the theory of learning styles. There's a theory out there that different people tend to process information in different ways, meaning that some people's brains are more susceptible to different modes of communication. These ways of perception are categorized into different learning styles. They are visual, you see the world through pictures and images, auditory or musical, you hear the world through music and rhythm, verbal, you understand the world through words, physical or kinesthetic, 
meaning you work with your hands to help make sense of the world, and lastly, logical or mathematical reasoning. Now of the five sensory processing modalities, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic seem to dominate. You may also be a combination of these styles and prefer to learn socially with other people or by yourself. But how can you tell if you're one or more of these styles? Well, it reflects on you as a person in the clothing you wear, the words you communicate, and your actions all give away your preference. For example, visual learning is very fast information processing. People who are visual learners will use words like, I see what you're saying, and talk really fast. They will create images in their mind's eye. Auditory learners, on the other hand, are commonly found in the music and radio industry. Their way of communication is almost sing-songy. If you were to wear an obnoxiously blue shirt, for example, an auditory preference might comment saying, that shirt's loud, yo. Kinesthetic learning is the slowest information process. Kinesthetic learning is done with action, making with your hands. This type of learning often leads to an artistic intelligence. It should be noted that there are several studies attempting to invalidate this theory. I'll put links to those in the description. However, there's also conflicting evidence that people, in particular those with learning disabilities, have a clear preference in information processing. I've personally seen this in working with children on the autism spectrum, where kids have literally told me that they think solely in picture format. Also, disorders like synesthesia exist where people can see sounds or smell colors. Kanye West apparently suffers from it, or audio processing disorder, which affects roughly 5% of school-aged children. Their brains simply process information differently than the rest of society. Just because you prefer to learn in a particular modality doesn't mean you can't learn to process information in another. You can be a combo of two. For example, I would consider myself more receptive to auditory information, hence listening to all my books via audio version in the car. But hands-on is another viable option for me. I love experience. I hope you enjoyed this video, and to find out what style you are, go ahead and take the quiz, and let me know in the comments below what you think you are. Hit the subscribe okay. okay, so I hope we enjoyed that video. So let's talk about the last uh, key aspect that you're gonna look at, uh, which is after looking at learning objectives and looking at learner preferences, you also need to look at practical limitations. You have to be practical as well when you're building out your courses. So in um, what, what kind of practical limitations should we watch out for? So key thing is we're selecting, selecting learning methods we're saying that there are three criteria, objectives, preferences, and then limitations. So if you look at objectives and preferences, out of the three criteria used for selecting learning methods, what are practical limitations? What, what, what limitations do you have usually, I know? Um, sometimes you have um, the duration of the program, budget. Mm -hmm. and then budget is a big one. A big one. And then sometimes you have, um, um, employees from out of country. Uh, I think in that case, mm -hmm. in particular one I had, they had to do a kind of visual, they were, they were, we beamed it to their, their own office in Port Harcourt while the training was Okay. Going. So that, that okay. was another aspect, yes. And then okay. another, and then another mm -hmm. go ahead. Another limitation could be the, um, the size, the, the the size of the the audience. Uh, yes. Sometimes the um, the client will give you too many. Or it's, um, I mean, the standard size for learning should be between 20, 25, or 30 at most. But sometimes they will give you up to about 16 a class, and it's like wow. you you wonder mm -hmm. what you want to do with 60 people in the class. Sometimes I just have to stand mm -hmm. in the middle of the room in order to be able to mm -hmm. reach out as many people as possible, you know, to ca kind of yes, try to engage yes. the entire, and it's exhausting, but it's worth the while sometimes you get all, all of them involved at the yes. end of the day, yeah. Yeah, so so here I look at um, budget. So we have the, the budget itself, as, as you mentioned, budget is a big constraint. There's even copyright restrictions as well. So you want to use some material online. Uh, we allowed to, is there any copyright restriction on using it? 
and uh, internet access for us in Nigeria, for example, internet. So right now we're using the internet. Sometimes the audio is not very good. Those are definitely practical limitations. Do we have internet in the other end? Does the clients have very good, reliable internet so we can do a media, which is webinar or virtual training? We need definitely solid internet access, internet connectivity. So those are practical uh, limitations we can look at. Another one is time constraints. You just mentioned that, you know, there's time constraints. So how effectively can we do training if there's so much, if we're supposed to do a five day course and the client is like, nope, I only have two days. So there's a practical limitation there. And how do you now circumvent that practical limitation? You have to think creatively about different media. So if you, instead of the classroom, you may decide to do online self-paced a bit or decide to send them some assignments or pre-work to do to cover some material that uh, you were supposed to cover in class. So those are practical ways to avoid practical limitations. <laughs> yeah. So another one is maybe here. Okay, let's let's recap. Okay, I just want to recap our learning methods and media. So yeah. So if we recap, yeah. So if I want to recap, let's see if everyone remembers some of the things we mentioned. So what? Give me three methods. Give me three methods. Example of three methods. Just give me examples of one of the three methods we mentioned earlier. I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. Peer discussion. Peer discussion is a, is a method. Yeah. What other method? Or really, I think it's four we mentioned. Four methods. So peer discussion. Yep. Watching the video. Media is how learners receive the training. It is the way the learning is delivered. That's the media. Method, on the other hand, is the active ingredients of the training. So active ingredients in the sense that, for example, let's say video. Video is a method. How am I delivering this video? Am I delivering it in a classroom? Am I delivering it online like I just did on this webinar? Where I'm delivering it is the media. So your peer discussion, peer discussion is a method. How am I delivering this method? Am I delivering it in a webinar? How do I do a peer discussion in a webinar or virtual training? There are some solutions, some virtual training uh, solutions that can break people into groups and they can have peer discussion. Uh, the peer discussion, am I recording the peer discussion and then I'm playing it as a podcast? It's possible. Podcast is a media. So th those are the things, a facilitator lecture. The facilitator lecture can be recorded. I can record it as a video and play that on, in, in the classroom. I can play that online. So that's methods and media. Media, since we've just mentioned media, media is classroom, online, or, or, or podcast. Really, that's it. Classroom, online, or maybe audio, pod podcast. Those are the media. So when you combine media, that is what is called blended learning. When you hear people talking about blended learning, this is combination of media. So I'm combining classroom with a webinar with a self-paced e-learning. That's called blended learning. And I am one of the advocates of blended learning. I think every learning should be blended. So I think before you come to class, you should already talk to your the participants that are coming online, just do an online chat. Once you do an online chat, hello, how are you? You've blended. You've actually used this online um, online plus classroom. And another way we do blended, especially for us at Brown Consulting, is we have our office training hub as our e-learning platform. And every single training we do in classroom, people have to log on two weeks before online. And once they log on online, they can chat with the trainer, chat with themselves, fill out their expectations, and do all sorts of stuff, download their material, watch some knowledge-based um, videos or knowledge-based exercises. Then they now come to the classroom. So we see we've blended classroom and self-paced e-learning. So I think blended is a very wonderful thing. I don't know. Eno, do you use any blended in your – do you blend? Um, what I try, I, I do is I, I send a pre, 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 um, assignment before the program 
I expect them to maybe give a feedback online, send a message or something. That's Oh, super. So so you give an assignment. So that means you're using the uh, workbook. You're using like um, a workbook which they can do online. Obviously, they're doing it online. Do they send you? How do they? How do you get the feedback that they've done it? Um, because they, they had some constraints. So I said, OK, they should um, actually print their uh, print, get, bring their prints, copy of their answers to the class. OK, super. So before the class started, we went. We kind of did a, a summary of what was uh, the ex the answers, the exercises. And cool. So those exercise, work exercise, which is a method, you deliver that method online. You told them to do it on their own, and then it, they now come to the classroom, which is another media. And so that's blended. Yeah. So that's that's blended in a way. So yeah, yeah excellent. So let, more examples of blended. You have, uh, for example, online self-paced pre-work plus classroom. That's that's yeah. blended just like I mentioned. And then another one could be virtual training plus self-paced e-learning. So this is all online. You are doing blended that's completely online. You've done a virtual training which is live, just like this webinar, as well as giving them online self-paced. So they can go and log on and do online self-paced. So so this, this video, for example, this our webinar is recorded. And once it's recorded, anybody that watches it after is now watching self-paced. Yes. But right now it's virtual, so it's uh, that's just how how you mix and match. So so that is how you use methods and media in designing learning. I don't know if anyone has any questions in the audience in our virtual audience that wants to add to this before Eno gives us a general overview of her experience, her career. And we're going to end with that. If you know, give us general overview of her career, how she got into learning, and uh, why she likes it so much, and what are the things she thinks for the future. So, any questions? Please type it in the chat. So, Eno, uh, how did you get into um, all this this learning career or L and D, okay. learning and development? Yeah, actually, it was when I was in banking. I was head of operations, and I found myself actually reading books. And then because we were in a market branch, Thursdays is environmental. I bring my, I, 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 we sit all sit down and I'll give a, a kind of, a, you know, talk about maybe like if it was a topic on an attitude I read about or something, leadership. And then by, I, I was doing this and I found out that I was actually enjoying it. So when actually I, I was, I, I wanted to leave banking, I said, you know, what do you want to do? I said, okay, I want to go into training. So I went into FITC, where mm. I actually learned the skills of training, uh, design, and all that. And by the time I left FITC, I got certified to be customer service a consultant and trainer. And, nice. um, and I just love the fact that I have an audience that I will talk to and impact them. I see them as my circle of influence where I can be able to reach people. And even if it's just one person out of the class that will go out and practice what has been taught. I mean, that gives me fulfillment uh, because basically in life, I saw myself that, look, I need to enhance myself in order to be able to build others, to be able to fulfill their own destiny. And mm. that's basically my passion when it comes to learning and development. Interesting, interesting. So how, how did you connect to ATD? How did that happen? Okay, for uh, that was 2009. Actually, a friend of mine, Bimbo Adibaki, actually attended 2008 and said, you know, this is where you should be. And nice. Ever since, I mean, when I got there for the first time, hmm, when you see thought-provoking leaders like uh, Ken Blanche, mm. uh, you see Bob Peck. I mean, you and you see the the the, the enthusiasm and the passion in which they deliver their 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 sessions. You mm -hmm. ask yourself, what am I doing? I need to make change <laughs> my direction. I need to change what I'm doing. You know, and that has helped me because each time I come back, there is like fire in my blood to mm. kind of impact that using the LDNI learning circles, you know, to be able to impact the knowledge that that I got from those uh, 
um, experiences. And then books, enormous books to read. I mean, I, just because of attending ATD, my my library has exploded. Exploded, huh? <laughs> exploded yeah. with materials mm. enough to last me a lifetime. And Super. I, it's awesome, you know, and meeting people like you. Uh, nice. Hoping that next in 2010, in 2000, and, this 19, 2020, probably I'll be an ATD speaker. Uh, okay. Hoping that will come to pass. <laughs> uh, super, super, super. All right. So uh, that's excellent. Thanks a lot, Anna. So what do you have, what advice do you have for people that are coming into the L&D space? As in what, let's say very fresh, they're just about to come into the L&D space. What advice do you have for them? Yeah, uh, coming into the L&D LD, uh, LD, uh, space, like I always tell people who, who find time to call me and say, no, what do I do? I want to come into this space. I say, look, and if right now we have the um, the center for management development that's cmd which they run two two weeks program basic and another two weeks for advanced i said mm -hmm. at least we have a platform where you as a talent development professional can learn can start off with and yes I, I i i personally attended that program myself in 2009 and that enriched my 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 career in the sense that i i knew what to do not only in designing and all that but also to be able to run learning and development as a business because if you can if you can be able to have that startup that will help you and then from time to time attend pro conferences in learning and development like the atd or even that which we in learner development network international did like last month you know kind of to help uh, enhance your your skills and knowledge in the in nice the, in the, so the so you advise that they they start off by doing that and learning from that and 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 also um just develop themselves mainly right so get get themselves developed read 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 there's so much free excellent stuff online go online follow some top leaders in the industry and then learn. And then, of course, um, you have a passion for learning and a passion for talent, a passion for training. You would yes. be an excellent addition to the L&D space. Yes, so yes. thank you very much, Eno. Thank you very much for honoring our invites. And uh, we will hopefully we'll have this online on our YouTube channel in the next one week. And uh, for everybody else, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you gained from this. It's already time. It's already one hour. Can you believe that? And yeah. um, <laughs> and we'll meet you again next month where we have another episode of our Talent Development Webinar Series. So thank you, everybody, and bye-bye.